The current state of the food system is unequal. Those of us who, who are either um, in the West or who are sort of privileged living in the South have more than have access to all of the diversity from around the world. And then you, you at the other end of the spectrum, you also have um, the majority of the world that is not actually able to access healthy and, and nutritious food. Indigenous foods in Mexico is, is maize, and that has, in very different kinds of ways, become an extremely dominant food, but not the local varieties that farmers there are still growing. On the African continent, um, colonialism had, uh, had a much harsher impact um, on the food system. And so you could see introduced crops such as maize and cassava that we sort of almost assume are local, but aren't actually indigenous to, to the land. So sorghum, millet, those would have been um, much more staple crops feeding the majority of the population. The Green Revolution was kind of a scientific intervention that happened mainly around the 60s, 70s and 80s in particular. Um, and it was aimed at addressing the food production crises that we're seeing around the world. Um, everyone had this Malthusian idea that increasing population, we don't have enough food, we need to grow more food, and we need to have high levels of productivity in the main foods that we, that we grow. And so there was a lot of investment that was made in plant production, in genetics, and that also also included uh, a lot of inputs. So obviously you need water, you need good soil, but you need a lot of nutrients. So fertilizers was a big component of this, as was pesticides. Because this was quite an intensive investment, it was only focused on a few of the main staple crops that we saw around the world. So mainly around maize, then also looking at, uh, at wheat and rice. Increasing production of these, these main staples uh, was sort of said to, to be able to feed the world in essence. Uh, but what you saw is that these uh, the subsidies that went into farming, particularly in places like the US, uh, but also to a certain extent in Europe to increase this, um, this productivity, um, it created further incentives for farmers to actually go in and kind of perpetuate these monocultures. So that's why, you know, if you fly over the US, you kind of just see these, these vast singular landscapes. It's becoming more and more difficult to be a, a smaller or a family farmer within the system. And so you're also losing those livelihoods and those connections to the land. You're also starting to see if people aren't growing their food that you tend to buy their food. But because of disparity in income, the kinds of foods that they can buy tend to be highly processed foods that are coming from an industrialized system. Again, where you're sort of seeing a lot of these subsidies going in to make foods cheaper, but it's only particular kinds of food. So you sort of see a high increase in, in salts and fats and and foods that aren't actually necessarily that good for you, but because this is all people can afford, uh, that's what they tend to have. You can actually grow, grow maize um, in, in Southern Africa, for example, um, quite well. It's a bit more water intensive, for example, than sorghum is. And so you start to see that the, the solution to that is, well, we need to make drought resistant maize sort of from a genetic perspective rather than just 
taking sorghum that's already kind of inherently drought, drought resistant and sort of thinking through the implications of what growing that could be. Um, again, it's looking at diversity rather than um, sort of rather than focusing on, on singular solutions.